by being a facilitator and a curator, that in a way is actually even more exciting than, than a, being a designer. Episode 125. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm actually in the RABA. Can you imagine that? Eh? Um, fantastic, beautiful morning that I had with Darren Bray, who is the founder and director of Studio Bad Architects, um, who are based in Hampshire. Darren has had over 25 years extensive experience in private practice, graduating from the Portmouth, Portmouth School of Architecture in 19. 19- Uh, 98 and he's also worked previously for I think around about 12 years he was at Pad Studio um, and he's also one of the co-founders and directors at Cora Um, and I think it's interesting having had both um, Wendy Perring and Roger Tyrrell on the show previously when we're discussing this kind of idea of reflexive practice and in this conversation um, Darren is also talking about this idea of deep listening and deep collaboration with our clients and the power that we can bring to our marketing efforts, our design efforts, understanding and being able to propose things which aren't always in the traditional realm of architecture through our ability to listen very deeply and work very intimately with our clients and Darren explains a number of projects that they've been working on and and the kind of process that that they've been deploying there um, as well as some of his insights into education he's also a tutor at Reading University and um, there is a lot of really fantastic and very thoughtful insightful um, content in this podcast so sit back relax and enjoy Darren Bray So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Darren, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Here we are in the uh, in the RIBA. Um, enjoying the beautiful scenery and daylight, and um, you have previously you were working at Pad, a twelve-year stint there, and you've recently set up Dan Bray Studio, um, and you're also working as a teacher of architecture as well. And I think we need to start. We've had an interesting conversation already this morning. I want to kind of pick up on some of those themes that we've already been describing and discussing and your approach as well, this idea of listening and the architect being a deep listener. What is it for you that makes a successful architect? I, th- I think for me that, um, particularly in the, in the 21st century, um, is that as architects we have to become deep listeners because you know we're facing some quite interesting uh, challenges in the built environment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether they be uh, with existing buildings, um, whether that be within education. I think what I've learned over the last 12 months since launching my own practice is that um, undertaking particular pieces of work with particular clients, um, it's about kind of standing back as an architect. And I think there's been a tradition within architecture that, you know, architects always kind of stood forward and said, I kind of know what the solution is, even yeah. though I've only just been on the site or I've been to the building. Um, and 
I think, you know, I use this word permission quite a lot, mm. that actually um, once you've got the trust of the client, once you've done a lot of listening, you're able to get the permission from the client to be quite bold in terms of your approach and your process. Um, and what I'm trying to do is enable clients to be fundamentally part of that design process. Now that might sound a bit of a cliche that you know we kind of talk about that as, as architects, but trying to get clients to define what their project is, whether that is in terms of design, but actually what is their project in terms of whether it's a business, yeah. you know, whether it's a church, whether it's a, a bookshop, whether it's a, you know, a kind of a, a retail uh, or commercial business. Um, I think to listen is to kind of unlock what the potential is of both the, the architecture, but actually what that business might actually grow to be. Mm. Um, and therefore, you know, having undertaken quite a lot of community engagement in the last 12 months, I'm kind of learning quite a lot about how we might adjust our processes. Um, and I've, as I've said previously, um, I think you know, it's really important to take on and tackle projects that we're actually kind of learning from, that we mm. can actually build back into our businesses and back into our processes so that when we come to the next project, we can kind of explain to a client, well, this is how we tackled the feasibility study. This is how we tackled the um, community engagement um, and for some clients, it's quite unnerving because they expect an architect to come to the table with a solution. Mm. And, and, I've, and I've just had that on a, on a church project where I think the church expected us to, to sort of walk in the door day one with a solution. And we said, well, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to stand back, observe and listen, and then maybe reflect back to you what we see. Now, that might, might not be a solution, but it might be what we see in terms of the opportunities or maybe some of the challenges. Um, and by doing that, I think the project becomes richer. Yeah. The client then begins to give you permission to be quite bold. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of learning a lot about myself. I'm learning a lot about architectural practice. Um, how does that reflect on, on the business? Well, it means that actually when you go to the next project, you need to carefully record that kind of listening and recording and community engagement process because you can very quickly get caught out in terms of the time that it takes. But you need to give it the time that it takes. Mm. But also, you know, thinking about that, you need to make sure that you've got plenty of other projects that can kind of run parallel to that because that process does take a long time. And, and I remember last year when we, when we undertook this church project in Southsea in Portsmouth, you know, the feasibility study probably took three months. Now, to some people that, you know, you'd probably say, well, how on earth do you manage to kind of deal with that within the business well you have to build it into your kind of planning and make sure that there are other projects that are going to be fee paying and are, and are going to run alongside it and they might be different sectors and might be different typologies so there's a lot of that that kind of deep listening work is that not a service that you would sell or is it a service that is kind of pre-project based I, I mean i think having learned uh, about it over the last 12 months it would it's certainly now becoming part embedded within the practice right so so we are you know on certain projects you know we are beginning to offer that as a as a kind of a deep listening process yeah um you know that might not be to every project you know if you're doing a you know a very small domestic project you know okay you know you you'll do some listening but you probably won't do the deep deep listening in the community engagement mm. so um you know it is something that we're now beginning to offer up to clients um not everybody wants you to do all that deep listening some clients just want you to do a solution you know, yeah if it's if it's a client that wants you to do a piece of housing you know whereby they need to deliver housing for you know uh their their uh, clients then you know you probably have to kind of do that quite quickly um so um i think you know it's about adapting as well to clients mm. you know i mean uh, don't get me wrong you know there are some domestic clients that i've got at the moment where they've had other architects try to tackle a project and it's not worked out and it's actually turned out that it, the reason it hasn't worked is because there hasn't been the listening process yeah again the architects come to the table and said i've got a solution here it is and particularly when you've got um you know maybe a family that a growing family they feel slightly frustrated that they haven't been listened to mm. so so I, so again you know I'm slightly contradicting myself, but you know it works for for every type of client. Mm. Um, and I, I guess I guess early on it's about unpacking with a client 
what it is they want from their architect. Yeah. You know, do, do, do they want a very quick solution? Uh, or do they want you to listen? And it's quite interesting where maybe there's been uh, a project that's sort of stumbled previously with somebody else and it hasn't quite worked out, that you have to be... I mean, you're quite nervous when you come to the table because you're like, oh, well, why hasn't it worked out? Is it because these people have an aversion to architects? Or, yeah. Or, or is it about... Now, the, now they've got a bad taste in their well, mouths. exactly. Or, is, or, you know, is it about, you know, the kind of the process that's happened? Yeah. And so... I think you have to be quite adaptable. So sometimes, you know, when you're halfway through a feasibility study and you've got like a whole roll of sketches, there's something in the back of your mind that says, right, you have to pause and this is the time to go and have the pre-meeting with the client right. and go and present, you know, some of those early solutions. And again, we did it with the church and it worked really, really well because we were able to test some ideas and some quite provocative, you know, uh, precedent images. And suddenly we were then able to really kind of push the agenda. So tell, tell, tell a little bit more about the, about the, the, the church project, because it seems like quite an interesting project where you're developing a lot of processes in your, in your business, um, both design-wise and both business-wise. Yeah, I mean, the church project, you know, as I said, I've learned an awful lot. And, and the first thing that we, we did with the church is they have a, a beautiful building that they've basically, you know, been given by the diocese in Portsmouth to take ownership but they were existing in a sort of 1960s building where they were holding their Sunday services and all their other uh, clubs in the week so we asked them to go and reopen the church the church had been um, condemned three years earlier by the archdeacon Mm. and it's sort of been patched up so they were slightly taken aback where we said the first part of the feasibility study process is to reopen the church re-engage with the space and let's do a piece of community engagement within that space. So that was a real testing point for them because they felt slightly nervous about doing that. Mm. But once they'd done it and we invited the whole community, we had local MPs and councillors that came, suddenly they realised that we couldn't start on this journey unpacking what the, you know, the potential was of this project until they engaged with the space. It would have been wrong for us to come with a solution on a, on a space that they weren't really using. Right. So, again, a lesson learned there. Had we just said, we'll come up with a solution, we'll deliver a set of drawings, let's just uh, crack on. Um, They learned a lot about themselves because what happened was they opened the building and then shortly after doing their Sunday services, they decided, we encouraged them to start a little pop-up cafe and a Mm. pop-up shop. Now, what began to happen was people started to re-engage with the building. Because it had been closed, everybody in the community in South Sea, as far as they were concerned, was the church was closed, therefore, you know, there was no Sunday service and there was no collective gathering. So by reopening the building, they started to re-establish the presence of the church within that community. And therefore, it wasn't just a case of people meeting on a Sunday to come to Sunday worship. It was about coming for a conversation. And so they started to do what we were doing, which was listening to the community, having a conversation, actually assisting people. So there were lots of donations that were coming to the church in terms of food, in terms of clothing, in terms Mm. of furniture. They they were selling some of it, but a lot of it was then donated back into the community. You know, we had we had homeless people coming to this church with 50p in the pocket, desperate to buy a pair of trousers for 50p, which the church, you know, then donated back to these people. So suddenly, you know, there was a kind of two-way process. We yeah. would have a conversation with the, with the client. We were then having a conversation with the building. But then all of that, we were having a conversation with the community so that we were able to just very slowly begin on this journey. Mm. And so I guess for all of us, you know, we were discovering things about ourselves, about the community, about the potential well, of the it, it, It's really fascinating, this particular process, um, and how reflexive it is and the sort of the, the art of listening about it. And it's non, it's non, you know, it's, it's not rushing to propose something. And I think this is something I've heard from some, like, you know, whether it's a small practice or a large infrastructure practice, the ability to be able to go deep into the listening of where the client is, it helps us to be able to market better. We can, mm. like what you're talking about here as well, is actually you're aligning yourself with the business case mm. of the mm. client. You're bringing your architectural expertise in problem solving and helping them 
facilitate the funds that's going to be able to have an impact on the physical asset at the end of, at the, end of the day. How, how do you, as a, well, it's interesting your experience as well in academia and being, and actually being actively involved in teaching. Does, you, does this process of listening come in, does it come from teaching or are you sort of encouraging your students to sort of start thinking about this as well or? Uh, well, I think, that's, I think that's a really interesting question and I, th I think it does. You, uh, um, I think as teachers, you know, we need to be quite deep listeners because, you know, you can imagine in a, in a studio of say, 10 to 15 people, you're going to get a, a whole mixture of people that, you know, think uh, creatively, design creatively and work very differently from mm. each other. So quite often you have to spend more time carefully listening to individuals, whether it's in a group or whether it's, uh, you know, one-to-one, -one. Mm. because some people feel more comfortable being one-to-one, -one. some people feel more comfortable in a group, but therefore understanding you know, those people and what, what they're interested in can unlock how they're going to deliver their work within university. So there is a very, very deep listening process, I think, that, that's required in education. Um, because, you know, I've found over the last couple of years teaching in first year at Reading University that um, we have some really, really amazing young people that come to the school. And they come, all of them come with different backgrounds, they come from different continents mm. and they come with different interests. And for me, it's about finding out who they are as people, what their background is, what they're interested in, what makes them tick, and therefore beginning to unpack that so that they might be able to embed that into a design project. Right. And therefore, for me, that's kind of what we're doing in the real world. Yeah. It enables them to think, oh, okay, you know, there is some worth in what I'm thinking about or what my background is. That's really, really important, you know, and that kind of listening uh, to students and then getting them to think, you know, that's how I work. I need to understand this project. I need to kind of communicate correctly. Mm. And, and at Reading, you know, we start the year with a, a really interesting little group design project where they have to make a structure. So they're working in groups of three or four. They have to design something that then reflects its context in an urban context in the centre of Reading. But then they have to work together to kind of produce a kind of dark design process and then deliver a structure. So again, it's about, it's about listening. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'd like to think now as a, as a, as a profession and whether you know, you're in business or you're in, in education, that whole piece around listening and communication is so important. Mm. Because without that... You know, you can't actually unpack a project, whether it's in design studio in, in the School of Architecture yeah. or, or, or it's in the real world. Um, and, and, you know, as I said, sometimes, you know, you've got to make some strategic decisions. You know, so some of the, some of the students find it quite interesting and challenging to move from a group project to an individual project. So at the moment, we've just moved to a, an ind individual project in the centre of Reading where we're in a context of on a little island in the middle of the canal. And some of them are really flourishing because they, they, they think, well, you know, I'm kind of defining this. Others are a little bit more tentative because they're not in a group context. And, and I, for me, that kind of reflects the real world. Yeah. You know, because, you know, if you're working on a particular project, um, you have to listen to everybody's voice. Mm. And, and to discard a voice, you know, I think that's where, as architects, we can fall foul of some challenges later on in the project. Yeah. Particularly, you know, we, we've all been there where you're in the middle of, you know, the, the, the project's actually appearing, whether it's, you know, an existing building or an interior project or it's a, uh, it's a new house. And suddenly the client stops dead in their tracks and goes, well, I, I didn't quite understand that's how, you know, this was going to appear. I mean... Um, you know, you come across it all the time, I think, in practice where, you know, some people visually kind of get your, your drawings and your, and your description, but then other people, you know, might find it slightly more challenging. So you have to do a little bit more work. Mm. You know, you have to produce that three-dimensional model that unpacks it. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that's, that's a real kind of education process, I think, for all of us. For, for you personally, what, what, what led to the creation of Dan Bray Studio? Um, for me, I mean, I've been, in, I've, I've been in architecture since I was 15, 16. I started out um, as an apprenticeship 
um, uh, so 32 years ago. Um, and therefore, my kind of career trajectory has been quite interesting because mm. I trained as a technician and then I went to university and I found right. this whole other world of creativity. So yeah. although I'd come from a slightly more technical background, when I went to university, I hadn't quite realized that this, there was this wonderful sort of creative design problem, uh, problem solving process. Mm. Um, so now, you know, sort of 32 years on, you know, I've just, just uh, reached a, a reasonably large birthday. And I, and I, you get to the point where you think, well, I've always wanted to run my own practice. If I don't do it now, it's going to be a little bit too late. Now, I'm quite fortunate that I, I have a teaching post of two days a week uh, and I have a very uh, supportive uh, professor at the University of Reading who's kind of helped that process. Yeah. Um, and if you talk to many people that have started their own practice, they've always been a, a teaching element. Uh, I, I was chatting to Bob Allies last week and he was telling me how he taught at Cambridge for two or three days a week and that, that, that enabled him to kind of launch you know, the practice on a, a stronger footing as far as Alison Morrison was concerned. So I think you know, many of us have, have kind of been in that um, kind of challenge. But also I guess it's about taking some calculated risks. And I just thought that if I didn't take a calculated risk now at this time of life, then I might kind of reflect back and think, what if? Mm. You know, what, what, what would have happened if I hadn't have launched my own practice? And having spent some wonderful years working with some, some great practices, um, I'd started out in my architectural career sort of 25, 30 years ago, wanting to kind of um, hope that architecture could have a social uh, and kind of community betterment. Yeah. Um, so there was definitely that angle, which is always... A bit of a challenge when you spent, you know, twelve years in in private practice delivering some wonderful private houses. You're always slightly nervous, thinking, "I'm launching a practice in 2019, the year of Brexit, and I'm going to sort of move across to a different typology in a different sector." Um, so that is, you know, quite a huge risk in a way. But I wanted to test the idea of kind of working with communities mm. and and seeing whether there was an opportunity. And actually. You know, that has grown really quite quickly. I would say 50% of my work now is within the kind of community and social sector. And what I'm finding is, is that people in those areas are kind of making their own projects. Mm. You know, they're finding the funds, they're doing crowdfunding, they're selling loan stock. You know, the, the little bookshop, October Books, which we did uh, last year, you know, there was just a, a can-do attitude. And it's the same with the church. Yeah. And it's the same with um, my project working with the Business Improvement District in Southampton. There's very much a, uh, a philosophy of, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll find a way of making it work. Um, it's so, quite entrepreneurial from a grassroots level in, in that sense as well. And you're kind of, that's why, hence why it's very important to be aligned with business cases. And Yes, it's, it's incredibly entrepreneurial. And I've, learned, and I've learned a great deal. You know, the bookshop that I worked with, they, they had a relationship they had a consultant, a cooperative consultant, who advised them on their business plan, advised them how they could set up the crowdfunding and selling the loan stock. And, and suddenly, as an architect, I, I, I think, you know, there's many of us that feel um, sometimes that we're a bit pessimistic, that maybe these projects won't actually kind of gather momentum. And, and I've learned that actually, to not be so pessimistic, to mm. be much more optimistic and that you know, if you, if you have a client that says, we're going to make this happen, then you, you just kind of work with them, mm. you know, whether it's on a business case or whether it's a, a, you know, a set of design drawings to, to set up the process. So, so, so when, when you set up the studio, was it a, I mean, often people go through that kind of knee-jerk reaction of like, they go straight into residential, that's the easiest thing to, to kind of come on. How did you begin to win these other more community-based projects or how did you start those kinds of conversations and and dialogues and is that the 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 sort of the, the trajectory that you you want to go yeah it's definitely it's definitely the trajectory i want to go uh, again it was a, it was around conversations mm. you know i i i set out a year ago um to go and meet you know really interesting people not necessarily um people that were going to deliver a, a, an architectural project on my lap uh, but people that were doing interesting things in the city in Southampton. And Southampton is quite interesting as a place that it doesn't have a particular history of having a number of well-known architects or even 
quite a large amount of architects. You know, if you go up the road to Winchester, there's a, there's a huge group of architects in Winchester. But I made it my goal to go out and meet who I thought were people that were making a difference in Southampton. Hmm. And once you start to have those conversations, um, you're able to just talk about your philosophy and the fact that, you know, one of the things that you're really interested in is listening yeah. and not just designing a project. Mm. And suddenly you start to get hired because there's a connection. And, um, you know, we, we have this fantastic connection with the church down in Portsmouth. But one of the other great connections I've made is, is with um, the Business Improvement District in Southampton. Right. You know, I just, I immediately hit it off uh, with the director and we, we started to have conversations. I started to get invited in to do presentations about some of my work. And then suddenly we started to have conversations about doing some work together around n not necessarily architecture, but brief writing and running competitions. And I think that's the other interesting thing for me in the 21st century, particularly related back to education, is mm. that th there's a notion that we have to follow this kind of traditional method of designing and delivering and building buildings. Well, you know... I think moving forward, there possibly is going to be less of that for some of us. Yeah. And that there are other methods of, of being creative and that, you know, writing design briefs to run competitions, to assist people strategically in writing briefs is just as creative as designing a building. And it, and it actually enables you to, to add a little bit more to your kind of unique selling point as, mm. a, as a practitioner. I love that. I mean, I love this, 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 this idea that you're actually now involved in designing the conversation or the framework which may facilitate a building or a physical asset, but doesn't necessarily need to. But actually, and that is, that is the remit of the architect. Mm. Is that we are we are facilitators of those conversations and we're problem solvers. Oh, absolutely. And and, and I think the other the other word that we're starting to overuse in, in, in what we do is curating. Mm. Um, and, and in Southampton now, through the work we're doing with the, the business improvement district, you know, we've create curated the competition, the people that are involved in it. Um, last night we kicked off our urban design lecture series, which we've curated. And I think, you know, although all of this stuff is is not going to be you know, delivering buildings. It's about having an impact mm. on a place. And it's about learning as well from the place. And that you start to have conversation with business leaders, with politicians and with, with influencers within, within the city. And you start to get pulled in to a number of directions to further discussion. Mm. And, and we had some great responses last night to our, our three speakers, you know, where people were starting to engage from the audience, talking about how Southampton as a place is moving in a positive direction. But actually, could we get more younger people involved in these conversations? You know, could the younger people drive change within the city? And for me, that's where it starts to get interesting and exciting, because you're bringing in more people into the into the conversation. And I think you know we have a you know we can have a positive effect on that as architects. You know, we 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 can bring about that change, and um, you know, by breaking down some of these barriers. You know, I think it, it could have real change within the public realm. Yeah. But also as a profession, if, we, if we're able to sort of, you know, maybe break down a little bit more of how people perceive us as architects, that we are facilitators, that we are curators, we're not just there to, to produce a set of drawings. Yes. And, and, and I joked earlier in a conversation about, you know, actually once you get past the design process, when you're sat in front of a computer just churning out drawings, you know, there isn't a great deal of joy in doing that. It's a, it's a, it's a means to an end, but, mm. you know, by being a facilitator and a curator, that in a way is actually even more exciting than, than being a designer. Yeah, yeah. No, there's all sorts of other possibilities that can end up kind of coming out of designing those kinds of conversations yeah. and, and it's this more unexpectedness to it. Absolutely. Um, you were saying earlier as well about you know, you, you were writing these competition briefs, but actually didn't necessarily have the desire to answer them. Yes. As such, and the client was perhaps yeah. a bit surprised by that you didn't yeah. want you didn't want to take that. Can you speak a bit more about that? Because I think that's really interesting as well in terms of allowing to let go of the mm. sort of propositional nature of what we mm. think it is that we do. Well, I th I think for me, being on this journey over the last twelve months, where we've done quite a lot of work with the with the bid in Southampton. Yeah. Um, They've asked us to maybe, you know, do more. Um, but in some respects, we've slightly stepped back and not necessarily refused, but we've said by bringing more people to the table, architects and designers, to be part of some of these competitions rather than us do everything. Yeah. Um, 
it, it, for me, it makes the possibility of there being many conversations in the city from many different people, mm. from many different backgrounds. And, you know, um, last week we were very lucky that, that Bob Allies came and spoke to our first years in Reading and he talked about how they go about doing their master plans where, you know, they might have half a dozen architects involved in that process. And it's a much more positive process because you get many different voices, many different ways of thinking. Mm. And therefore, again, I think as architects, we don't need to do everything. You know, we, 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 we can step back and we can allow other people. And so we've invited lots of other architects to come to Southampton and be part of, you know, design processes and now part of our lecture series. So, you know, I think, and some clients actually now have said to us they really respect us for that. Um, and we've won work off the back of saying no yeah. know, to, to other things because that it, they see that as refreshing. Yes. So b by bringing more people to the table, um, in a way, it takes a bit of pressure off because I wouldn't want to, you know, take all the work that's been you know, potentially handed to us. Mm. It's interesting in saying, saying no can actually lead to more work because it kind of, I suppose, yeah. demonstrates where your intentions are. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and, and I, you know, I think there's, there's, there's real benefit in... It's not just necessarily saying back, back no, but, you know, saying no, but saying, oh, I've got a solution. Yeah. You know, I want to bring somebody else to the table to do that. How, how do you bring this into your teaching work as well? Because, again, I can kind of, this is a refreshing approach it was, um, in an academic environment as well. I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, I'm out of touch with academia. I haven't been inside it for, an, uh, you know, for over a decade. Um, is there a big change now happening in, say, what's happening at, at Reading in terms of, being more collaborative, being, um, you know, it's not all just about the producing of a singular vision and project, but actually the architecture, particularly as a profession, is way more collaborative than, than people give it credit for. And that this actually, addressing this very early on in the, the kind of creation of young, of the next generation of architects will actually have a massive impact on how we're perceived by the public. Yeah, I, th I think so. And I, I, in a way, I you know, I describe it as a slightly more grown-up conversation that we're having now at Reading in mm. that, you know, we were chatting earlier that, you know, they're doing an architecture degree, but in a way that is a bit of a foundation to, to the rest of their career. So, so, for example, you know, on our industry and practice course now, we're asking students to write a couple of paragraphs about what, what, where they are at the moment and what their future might mm. be. Now, their future may well be linked to a creative practice, but it might not be architecture. In, in the truest sense of the word, mm. you know, and, and some of them now are really starting to think quite hard when, when I say to them, well, you could, you could go and work for a developer or you could be a developer or you could go and work for a contractor or you could go and do set design for Star Wars or you could go and design festivals. And I think for them, it takes the pressure off. Yeah. That it's pressure that may be imparted by themselves or their family or the way in which they look at architecture that maybe by taking the pressure off, you know, they feel far more kind of reflective and are able to have a bit more kind of permission to say, well, I don't have to do part two and I don't have to do part three. Because once you do get past part one, there's a great deal of pressure mm. um, that comes with, I've got to do part two, then I've got to do part three. Uh, what happens when I've done part three? Do I launch my own practice or do I go and work for somebody else? Whereas some of them are actually moving on to other postgraduate courses that might be film studies. Or it might be project management. And I find that far more refreshing because it means that people don't go down a route whereby, you know, they get the part two, they get the part three, and then they're like, oh, actually, this wasn't my expectation of what architecture was about. Yeah. And um, so what we're doing within the industry in practice is to try and bring a few more different voices to the table. So we're bringing developers in, you know, we're bringing um, maybe architects that run exhibition design practices mm so that students can kind of understand that, you know, there are lots of different disciplines. And, and you know, there are other schools that I've visited recently. I, I'm very fortunate that I get invited down to, down to Brighton to the interior architecture course. And Gemma Barton, who runs the course down there, has this kind of amazing, refreshing way of uh, allowing students to kind of look at a whole different series of processes. So they will bring film into their process. Mm. They'll bring, you know, kind of uh, writing scripts that then feeds into a film, but then it becomes architecture. And, you know, I've met some 
young people down there who are doing some really quite entrepreneurial work. So I think we need to be, you know, in a way, we need to be kind of redefining, you know, what, what architectural practice is in, in the 21st century. Yeah, and it is, it is a broad and complex conversation because, you know, there's, there's the sort of traditional form of architectural practice and the ability that, you know, being an architect gives you a new way of looking at the world and engaging in the world, mm. which can be the bedrock for all sorts of other entrepreneurial ventures, mm. ideas, mm. and actually making that connection explicit as, as early on as possible. And I like this idea that you're talking about, you know, actually giving yourself permission to, you know, not be an architect yeah. in a way. And I think that that's really refreshing. And it kind of seems counterintuitive in a way, or almost sort of like, oh, but well, what about the profession? But actually it could, it could have a massive, massive impact on on how the profession operates how we view yeah. ourselves and and, and well, the relationship with yeah with well clients. you know imagine imagine if say 10 percent of our uh, students who are studying architecture went off and, and became planners or or if they um became clients mm. um and you know i've had certain students at, at kind of part two level who've gone off and done something else but they've come back to architecture and in a way, that's that's uh, more that's a kind of slightly more positive kind of reflection where they kind of tried something else mm. and thought, oh well, I thought that was going to be fulfilling, and they come back to architecture. Whereas, you know, I, th I think there's always been this pressure that, you know, you've got to get your part one, your part two, your part three, um, and of course, you know, there's more financial pressure on students. Yeah. Um, so you know, by kind of maybe taking off a little bit of the expectation of having to follow this process, <clears throat> you know, enables students to think slightly differently. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I, I, a few weeks ago, we, we were having a conversation with all our first years at Reading, and I, I think they're already beginning to think that, you know, they might go off and do other things. They might not do. Oh, uh, uh, but, you know, a degree is a long time. You know, three years, you can you can completely change your your mind. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, you get into practice for a year or two before you you come back to do your part two. And and lots of students, you know, they either it is definitely the thing they want to do, or or it's not. Mm. Um, so, you know, I I think we again it comes back to that listening thing. If students are you know asking you questions about you know what you think a career in architecture looks like, well. You know, I couldn't really define what a career in architecture looks like in the 21st century. Yeah. Because out there in, in, in the real world, it's changing, you know, day by day, week by week, you know, and, and we are having to be more flexible in the way that we define ourselves as architects. Yeah. Uh, particularly when, you know, you see that the high street is changing and therefore we're going to have to respond as designers to, you know, how, how do we do that? Well, we, we do, you know, lots of research and listening. Mm. You know, and the, re the research is... Well, th this, this is where it's so exciting is because when we start taking this more, we ad adopting this process of being a listener, mm. um, then we're able to absorb what the kind of cultural trends are mm. and we're able to, you know, put, you know, give off a solutions. And I don't want to even use the word propositions, but solutions, because yeah. then we, we stop necessarily thinking about architecture as being always a physical solution. Yes. And, I, and, and in that conversation is... You know, that there's a whole rich world and then we can start looking at architecture as more akin to learning a language yes as opposed to uh, a specific profession now that might sort of cause i don't know it's a, it's a different way of, of viewing it no i, I no it's, it's something that i i would definitely subscribe to because i've had a few conversations with people about it in the last year particularly around when you start to look at climate change, yeah. and particularly, you know, a lot of our projects now about reimagining existing buildings, and I've been saying to certain people in the profession that maybe run quite large practices, you know, would it, would it matter if you were appointed to do a feasibility study on a, a site or a, or a building, as long as you were being paid a fee to do that, if the outcome at the end of that was that that wasn't the right site or it wasn't the right solution, then fundamentally that's still a positive outcome. So, you know, if, if a client came to you and said, um, I'd like you to design on a, on a greenfield site in the middle of nowhere, you know, you might undertake a piece of work and say, well, actually, I'm not sure this is the right solution. Yeah. You. you know, maybe we need to look at a different solution. Yeah. Maybe there's a different site or there's a different building. So I think, you know, we, we need to be uh, slightly more reactive 
Hmm. You know, and and if a client came to me and said, you know, I want you to design a particular building in a in a particular uh, context, if I thought that that was the wrong thing to do, and that that was not going to have a positive impact on the built environment, and it wasn't going to align itself with what we should be doing, you know, around climate change, then I would say so. Yeah. And and again, we're having those conversations in in schools of architecture. We're bringing people in. We know we had. Um, Doug King from Bath University a couple of weeks ago, who came to talk purely about what it might take to produce as a, a, a zero carbon economy in the United Kingdom. And suddenly, when you start to unpack that, you know, it might be quite depressing in a way, but it starts to make you understand what we need to do yeah. as architects. Yeah. That, you know, we can't be passive in all of this. Yeah. You know, we we need to be not just thinking about, well, I want to do a building because I'm an architect and that's what I do. We have to be thinking about, you know, the next 10, 15, 20 years mm. and what impact our work may or may not have. And th- th- this is really, really fascinating because it, it, it starts to open up a different conversation about not waiting for the brief almost. Yeah. And that then we got to think about, well, how are we going to start communicating these ideas out there to and who will whose problems can we solve mm. this way of thinking mm. that gets into the realm of like this is being this is it's marketing essentially yeah and it's about constantly but doing it in a way where we're educating and kind of communicating ideas which i think architects are very good at doing yes. naturally but we're very good at doing it um to each other yes we're masters yeah, yeah. at doing it and that's yeah, yeah. that's one thing that makes the profession very special and very special to be part of and how do we become masterful at spreading these same sorts of ideas to the people who are actually commissioning buildings? And mm. they're already in the mindset of like, well, we need a building to solve this problem, like a property developer. Now, they've got a different business case. They've got a bit a different um, perspective on how the land is going to be used. They haven't necessarily, you know, climate change is somebody else's problem, mm. perhaps. And mm. some, and for some, for some of them, I'm not saying all developers are like that. So it's very important that we're able to open up listening and dialogue with the broad range of potential clients mm. so that we can start answering their problems before it even gets to the conversation around buildings in yeah and no, i think i think that's really important and, and i you know i think there's a there's an interesting piece of work or research or whatever you want to call it in that you know you you could you could set up an architectural practice tomorrow mm. and um Actually, it's quite interesting. There are a few architectural practices now that are beginning to list on their website what they won't do. Uh, and, and so what I was about to say was that you could set up an architectural practice tomorrow purely based on undertaking, you know, kind of research and feasibility studies based on unlocking the potential of a client's challenge. Hmm. So, you know, saying that, well, you know, I won't, I won't design a, a brand new building in a green, on a greenfield site. And there are architects out there now who are stating that as their manifesto on their websites, that they will only work and reuse existing buildings. I mean, we're kind of saying that now. That's kind of, that's part of our, you know, our thinking and our way of working and our mm. philosophy. But I think this idea that, you know, you might only do certain things as a positive um, kind of influence on the built environment um, by tackling challenges that clients might not actually be thinking about yeah they might just be thinking about you know their bottom line their shareholders um whereas actually if you build in the kind of much more kind of positive spin on it all and say to clients well you know if we do this you know this we're going to reuse this existing building uh, actually how about we put three uses in this building rather than one use your use and again, you know, those are things that we're doing now where mm. we're working on projects where we're looking at putting three or four different uses in a building um, so that there's a chance of survival for those businesses. Because we all know that if you, if you go out onto the high street now, there are so many old typologies and old businesses that, you know, can't exist in 5,000 square feet of floor space. That's gone. That's, mm. that's, that, was, that was the 20th century. Mm. You know, the 21st century has got to be micro, got to be mixed. Um, it's got to be a whole series of, of different uses. Um, but, you know, I, I think, yeah, you could, you could run a really interesting business by just doing feasibility studies, by unlocking the p- potential in both a building, but also in a client's business. 
Um, and that's kind of what's happened with the, with the church project in that we kind of designed our own business plan by opening the building up and doing a pop-up shop and a pop-up cafe and making substantial funds over six months by opening that building up two days a week. Yeah. You know, so you're almost being able to kind of demonstrate to a, a funder or somebody like the diocese that's going to fund our church project that, you know, you've got a business case. It works. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Darren, absolutely fantastic speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.